Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, and, and a good morning to all of you in North America. My name is Aubrey Pomeranz. My name is Aubrey Pomeranz. I'm the head of the archive of the Jewish Museum Berlin, and I'm also the head of the dependence of this archive, of the archive of the Leo Beck Institute, New York, here in the Jewish Museum in Berlin. And I welcome you on behalf of both institutions. I warmly welcome you to this first panel of the Shared History Conference, 1,700 Years of Jewish Life in German-Speaking Lands. With me on this stage are my colleagues Inka Bertz and Tamar Lewinsky, and uh, my colleague uh, Therese Zier couldn't come here today as was planned, but she is going to join us online. So needless to say, we... Um, would have preferred to have this event live with you, the audience, with us in this um, room. So it wasn't possible, unfortunately, and I hope that you're all well in those difficult times. Fortunately, the Jewish Museum Berlin was able three and a half months ago to open the new permanent exhibition after five years of intensive work. The exhibition presents history and culture of the Jews in Germany from the beginnings to the present day in four big rooms. And these four big rooms are separated into uh, several topics that highlight specific aspects of Jewish life beyond uh, the borders of Germany. The four rooms have uh, the topics of um, Jews in the context of their surrounding societies, and inclusion and exclusion are the big poles around which the stories of Jewish history are told in this permanent exhibition. And of course, in every historical epoch, the criteria and the conditions for um, inclusion and exclusion within the community and uh, from the side of the host society is negotiated anew. So all the um, subjects that are going to be debated over the um, two days in all uh, the panels and groups during this conference are also part of the permanent exhibition. And we think that this is the most relevant exhibition on the topic of 1,700 years of Jewish life in German-speaking lands. And um, this, um, the exhibition on the um, 58 object is going to take place next year and it's hopefully going to be with us for many more years to come and we're also looking forward very much to welcome you, welcoming you the audience back into the rooms of our museum hopefully soon so um, we're going to talk about some of the objects um, here today overall in the permanent exhibition we have more than 700 um, exhibits and um, we also borrow some exhibits uh, from other institutions, for example, the Leo Beck Institute. And Inga Bertz is going to tell us more about one of these objects in her presentation. Ilka is the head of the collection of this house, and she's uh, the curator for art. And um, she talks about um, Darb's painting of the bust of Moses Mendelssohn, uh, the ban on images, the reception of antiquity, and media history. Thank you very much for um, this introduction. Welcome, everybody. It's a really strange situation to be talking uh, to you through cameras instead of face to face. So um, it's not a new thing that a conference um, is opened by the Jewish Museum with the topic of Moses Mendelssohn. It leads us back to the um, first years of our institution. So the topic Moses Mendelssohn is a symbol of a shared history in the double sense. Um, I could have another presentation about that interesting uh, topic uh, on another occasion. Today I want to talk about a specific object. Uh, this object was, is a painting. It was painted in 1786 by Darbes, a portrait painter from Berlin. And on this painting uh, you see the bust of Moses Mendelssohn made by 
by Jean-Philippe Tessa. This painting is part of the art collection of the Leo Beck Institute, uh, which organizes this conference. Since the opening of the Jewish Museum, so for almost 20 years now, we um, are um, lucky enough to be able to present this painting to our audience, and it opens um, our exhibition on Haskalah and Salon. So today I have the opportunity to thank the colleagues from New York for um, their um, trust in lending us this unique object for such a long time. And uh, we want to highlight the object's um, history, the history of its painter, when it was painted, and of course I want to tell you something about the bust that was painted here and um, how it was received back then and in the aftermath. The Leo Beck Institute received uh, the painting by, uh, from Julius Held, an art historian and um, an expert in Dutch painting, he um, donated the painting in remembrance to his sister Ida Bloch, who had emigrated to Israel. He had bought it um, on the art market in New York, and um, back in the middle of the 19th century, it was still in the collection of the Prince of Hohenzollern Hechingen in Schlesien Löwenberg. But this collection was dissolved in 1890 and sold. So this provenance leads us straight ahead to the unusual women who were uh, moving around um, in um, the society of Mendelssohn in the middle of the 1780s. Uh, we are speaking about the Salonier Dorothea von Kurland and her half-sister, um, the writer Elisa von der Recke. They um, corresponded with Mendelssohn and Dorothea invited Mendelssohn to her castle in Friedrichsfelde. And um, Do Dorothea's a daughter then married um, somebody from the Hohenzollern Hechingen family. So this is how the painting then probably got to Löwenberg. Um, the painter, Johann Friedrich Dabes, had lived in Russia for a long time before he came in Berlin in 1785 and became a member of the Academy and a professor for portrait painting in Berlin. He was in close touch with um, the aristocracy in Kurland and also with the Jewish upper class in Berlin. 1786, um, Dabs was uh, very busy and uh, displayed um, famous portraits, and he also um, displayed um, a painting of a marble, of a marble bust. So maybe that's already our painting, and maybe the skull on the painting that was discussed back then was a reference to the. So maybe our painting, our object was commissioned by one of the two ladies I already talked about, one of the two fans, so to say, of Mendelssohn. What we know is that the marble bust was financed by 20 friends of Mendelssohn. They donated 400 talers to the sculptor Jean-Pierre Tassar who was the royal court sculptor back then, and um, all of these 20 friends received a little plaster cast version of this marble bust as a thank you. So, um, maybe the painting was a replacement of the three-dimensional bust. And maybe it was one of the two princesses, after all, who commissioned the bust and the painting. And that would be very interesting, because usually uh, crowdfunding back for art back then was only carried out by men. The bust shows Mendelssohn with a kind of toga. Uh, it's a quote of antique portraits, and um, the inscription on the pedestal by the poet Ramler also evokes uh, the vision of the Socrates of Berlin, which was back then a uh, widely known perception of Mendelssohn. It's quite unusual that Mendelssohn allowed himself to be portrayed in a three-dimensional bust back then. It's the first three-dimensional bust we know of um, a Jew that was um, made during the lifetime of this person. 
On the pedestal, we read that this um, that the portrait philosopher Mendelssohn was true to the laws of the uh, forefathers. The Haskala brought about a very interesting portrait culture, paintings, sketches, engravings, but that was similar to the art scene in uh, New York, uh, Venice or Amsterdam. But in no other city were there any busts um, from the Jewish upper class. Mendelssohn went one step further. He decided that it is not relevant uh, whether an image is two-dimensional or three-dimensional. The decisive thing for him was that uh, there is a ban on worshipping images. You should not um, see images as an idol. That's the central thing. Um, that's what he found important. But he didn't mind if the image itself was two-dimensional or a three-dimensional bust. He thought that art belonged to a different sphere. And um, among the 20 friends who financed this bust were also Jews, and they obviously agreed with him. And the bust was then erected in the Jewish Free School. So let's go back to the idea of Socrates and um, the perception of Mendelssohn as a kind of antique figure. 785, this style was quite popular. The director of the Academy, Frisch, um, had Mendelssohn painted in Grisailles um, in the style of an antique cameo. So the reduced colors of this Grisailles painting um, influenced Darb's painting because he also uses a lot of gray. He um, certainly knew the previous painting. In 1784, it was on the cover of Zöllner's Buch about Mendelssohn called Jerusalem, and later also on the Mendelssohn biography. After um, Mendelssohn's death in um, 1786, the cameo portrait become ex became extremely uh, popular and also Tassard's bust. The son of Tassard, um, spread copies, uh, lithographies of uh, the bust and the painting, and there were little miniature porcelain figures of the bust sold. So the bust of Tassar and um, the paintings determined how people saw Mendelssohn in the decades after his death. But then they were forgotten. Just as what uh, Mendelssohn was forgotten. In the next century, um, he was marginalized as a popular philosopher, and classicism also um, became less relevant and was replaced by more national um, forms of art and um, aesthetics. Mendelssohn was only remembered um, at the 100th anniversary of his birth. But um, the audience then didn't want um, antique portraits anymore, but they wanted um, more naturalistic portraits. So the Mendelssohn portraits of um, Anton Graf and uh, the second portrait by uh, Frisch uh, from 1783 were um, used of inspiration, but um, the new portraits were more not more now more naturalistic. And even on uh, such images as the one you see here, you had um, the Mendelssohn portrait in profile. And this is the miniature you see here. Thank you very much for your attention. So we agreed that the three presentations are going to um, start our panel. There's one going to be one presentation after the other, and uh, then we will hopefully have questions about all three presentations. The second presentation is going to be given by my colleague Therese Zier. She is the curator for photography here in the Jewish Museum, 
Uh, she is going to talk about a series of photos that belongs to the room catastrophe, uh, the years between 1933 and 1945. Her presentation has the title um, Photographing in Spite of Danger, Werner Fritz Fürstenberg's Photos of Antisemitic Signs in Nazi Germany. I welcome you very warmly. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to make a presentation and I would like to share it with you now. I would like to repeat its title. It's um, uh, Taking Photographs uh, in Spite of Danger to Life, Anna Fritz Fürstenberg's uh, pictures or uh, photographs of anti-Semitic signs in Nazi Germany. And we can see 26 uh, photographs um, these are photographs of anti-Semitic signs, but also signs in showcases and shops. All the photographs um, were taken by Werner Fritz Fürstenberg, showing mostly rural areas. And he docu documented these signs in order to show how Jews were marginalized in that times. Werner Fritz Fürstenberg was uh, an was the owner of the leather shops, Albert Rosenheim, together with his brothers. And after the boycott of April 1933, he intensified the export business. And in 1933, he opened a very successful subsidiary in Amsterdam, where he lived from then on. And he remained uh, strongly associated to the headquarters in Berlin, and he traveled a lot between Amsterdam and Berlin. These photographs were probably taken during one of these journeys. The photographs um, arrived at uh, the collection of the Jewish Museum of Berlin as a permanent loan by the son and the grandson of the photographer by F Thomas Alexander Fürstenberg. And I would like to extend my gratitude to them so that um, the photographs uh, can be part of our collection and I'm allowed to speak about them today. And when we prepared uh, our permanent exhibition, we made intensive researches about the stock and we looked into the photographs, examined them, and we had many different um, results. I would like to um, share them with you now in short. Of course, we... Um, uh, examine the question where the photographs were taken and we have some hints on the photographs themselves. Um, we see a sign Achtung, for example, at, on one of the photographs and on the other two photographs um, we have the inscriptions Hildesheim and Heiserter. And on the right hand side, um, on the top, you also see a train track, which was a very interesting hint, um, the, the, the course of this track. And we also have some buildings, houses that can be seen on the pictures, and they, st they still exist. We also have some hints that Fürstenberg uh, was driving a car, which can be seen on the photographs on the right side. Um, on the bottom picture, there is a, just a small part of the car. And uh, thanks to these hints, we could reconstruct his route. He drove from Berlin to the Netherlands, and he drove on the Reis Road, number six, through Bad Hatzburg, Hildesheim, uh, passing Hanover to Lübeck, and then to, Netherlands, to the Netherlands. Uh, another important question was the date of the photographs. And we have some hint on the photographs themselves as well. You can see in the top row, we have some issues of the Stürmer, the paper, and they can be dated to August 1935. And we also have some further hints in nature. On the left side, on the bottom row, you can see um, a harvest car, or you can see the leaves on the trees, and uh, these are all hints that uh, refer to the end of the to late summer. So we can um, assume that the pictures were taken in August 1935. Um, 
It's also very interesting to have a look at the texts on the signs because they show how brutal um, these signs were. Because on the left hand side, you can see that Jews are uh, not desired or Jews have nothing to do in Arbeck or the contact to Jews means an exclusion from uh, the community or Jews um, have to take responsibility for their lives. And we also have a further sign on the right sign that the department store opposite uh, on the street belongs to the Jew David Boas, which is a personal def uh, defaming. It's very striking that uh, uh, you can also see how what they are very different in the uh, fonts, um, and this is a hint that uh, they were locally written, and they also show um, how strong uh, the marginalization of Jews was in the rural areas especially. Anti-Semitism, marginalization, and discrimination were very decisive in the everyday lives of Jews and they fled to bigger cities because being anonymous was uh, a kind of help for them to establish a life. And the fact that the signs uh, disappeared after 1935 shows that um, people escaped the rural areas. It's also very striking when we look at the signs and the photographs that there are no people on it on them. Um, so they are very uh, scary, actually, and you, you maybe there are some exemptions. You can see uh, two people here in front of the showcases, showing their backs to the photographer, and on the right hand side you can see uh, some people on bicycles um, that uh, go away from the photographer, and this also suggests that there was a certain degree of risk when taking these pictures. So. Um, he had to be alone when he took these pictures, and he took a lot of uh, photographs from uh, the car, from the inside of the car. And you can see in the bottom, next to the car, there is his fiancée with a dog. She, she's holding a dog, and it looks like a tourist photo. Um, so uh, yes, they, they, they use the dog um, to um, so that they look like tourists and a, a private Jewish businessman uh, driving through rural areas without a protection. This means or this shows that there was very high, high risk um, at this very courageous action to him. Um, these uh, the objective of these photographs is documentation and information. And he first of all had to take these pictures very quickly and uh, not raising any attention. So he didn't want to have high quality uh, images, but um, he wanted to have a, a large collection and a very wide range of these signs. And um, he was very sensitive uh, towards the increasing marginalization of Jews in Nazi Germany. And therefore, he was um, increasingly ready to document this, uh, trust these atrocities um, in spite of all the dangers. And he handed over copies of these photographs to the Central Jewish Information Office in Amsterdam, the predecessor of the current Wiener Library. And there, uh, there is a collection of information about Nazi Germany and persecution, and there are some slideshows about this. We know that his photo, his photographs were used in 1935 and 1936 um, with distorted information in order to protect him, who was still in Germany, or in many cases in Germany. They renamed the routes he was driving along. Uh, along in like Düsseldorf Berlin, for instance, and he was also um, described as a motorcycle driver from the Netherlands. And 
you can also see that the face of his fiance was whitened so that the, her identity was um, protected as well. The photographs can be seen in the permanent exhibition in the context of national socialism presented in this double showcase on the right hand side. On the left hand side in the same room, uh, there is a big installation with uh, a lot of examples of anti-Jewish um, measures. And we can also see a map, a violence map, which informs about anti-Semitic violent acts between 1933 and 1938 in Nazi Germany. In general, it was very important to us to show na national socialism from a Jewish perspective. So we used Jewish sources and um, there were some exceptions, but um, mainly Jewish sources. And the photographs of Furstenberg are a perfect example for that. Of course, we also have pictures of anti-Semitic signs from the perspective of the perpetrators, like in the midst of uh, celebrations, village celebrations. But the fact that the Jewish businessman was successful in documenting marginalization with his camera is very decisive. And uh, it makes this collection to a very specific uh, document. On the last slide, you can see some sources and uh, literature sources. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Theresia. In the three and a half months when the museum was still open, or two and a half months maybe, um, visitors were really fascinated um, of these pictures, of these photographs of Furstenberg. And now we will uh, listen to uh, the third presentation by Tamar Lewinsky. She's curator for contemporary history in the museum. And together with Teresa Zia and Martina Ludeka, she designed the um, room of, a, of the area where migration plays a central role and collecting the history of migration. This is, um, or objects of migration is the presentation's title. Thank you, Ari. With the immigration of uh, Russian-speaking Jews from the former uh, USSR, the Jewish community in Germany changed, basically. And uh, migration does not only play a decisive role since the 90s, Directly after the war, East European displaced persons came to Germany and a small part of emigrated German Jews came back to Germany and small groups, um, small migration groups came back from, com came from um, Poland, Hungary and Iran. And in the last two decades, we have a very strong migration from Israel. So migration is not only part of German history, but it's a constitutive. Uh, part of Jewish life in Germany after the Holocaust. Um, but um, this was, uh, has not been reflected in our collections. So in order to close this gap, uh, since 2016, we um, have a project in place titled Object Days. And the results of this uh, project and how these are presented is described in my short presentation. The basic idea of the project, um, which is implemented together with Teresa Zia and Alida Kromova, we ask Jewish people to show us different objects that are linked to their migration story. and. Then starting with these objects, we make interviews, uh, we collect and, photo, uh, and take photographs of these objects. We also have our photograph, photographer Stefan Pramme with us, and he portrays all the participants together with their objects so that we can tell a story and we already have a, a large gallery of different portraits and we would like to integrate them into our collection and close the gap in this way. We also have similar formats 
a bit uh, similar degrees of participation. Uh, this is a very good format that is uh, very fitting for urban and rural historical museums. And Munich is the only city with a Jewish uh, museum that has already put in place a, such a format with a temporary collection. The current status is um, that we have already carried out object days at six places with the participation of 100 people uh, between the age of 20 and 90. The major part of participants uh, came to Germany um, since 1990, but um, we also have objects uh, from different migrations uh, like Poland, Hungary, Israel, United States, Mexico, Belgium, and Morocco, just to name some of them. The project uh, has not been uh, evaluated uh, and has not uh, is, is not finished yet. This is all only a short overview of it. Um, let's have a look at uh, the roots of migration. Migration is reflected in different ways in uh, biographies like remigration, serial migration, or professional mobility. And the reasons and the circumstances of migration are very diverse. They have different degrees of um, voluntariness, uh, economic conditions, uh, destinations, and of course, family structures play an important role as well. Um, let's have a look at three examples. The parents of this participant uh, got to know each other in, in the English emigration, and together with their uh, children born in England, they uh, returned to Germany, to Dresden to the home uh, city of the birth city of the father. And this menorah and the medal tell the migration story of the parents. On the on one hand, um, the flight of persecution and then, then the politically motivated return. Sometimes migration is a movement stretching over several uh, generations. In the family of Leora Jaffa, the great grandmother, grandmother, mother, and daughter do not live on the continent where they were born. And uh, this uh, embroidered um, tapestry is from the grandmother from Lithuania who spoke six languages and from there the family went to the United States over through South Africa and then Leo Rajafa came to Germany with this tapestry. Vera Primakova had, uh, you know, all know this kind of bag and uh, these bags are uh, often linked to migration in a negative way as a Turkish suitcase. And in this bag, she took along objects that were very useless in her new life, but it was a symbol of transition, and she still keeps this bag since her emigration, um, so more than 20 years already. So the met metaphor of the suitcase is uh, very often used and uh, it symbolizes uh, migration that you have to leave uh, the majority of your objects. So you can take only things that fit into the suitcase. So these objects have a very special significance. So if you look at objects of migration um, that are Actually, the basis of biographic uh, conversations show um, how important they are to these people. The object of migration that we've seen so far can be um, put into different categories. I just want to name some of them. It's not complete, of course. There are objects that describe the process of migration, like crossing a border or traveling, like um, passports or different documents from the hostel when people arrive. Other objects um, give a hint to the cultural context in their country of origin, like uh, discs and books or souvenirs. We also have um, souvenirs um, from the family that originate from the family that uh, are very important like um, 
a traveling book from the 19th century or jewelry or last photographs that remain from the family. And these objects, of course, um, have a very strong uh, symbolic function. Uh, these objects become Jewish uh, due to their biography and their story and also by the person uh, that owns them, who owns them. But there are some other objects that are directly linked to Jewishness or family traditions, like a kosher pen uh, that came along from Ukraine the, or the traditional west of, west of a rabbi. This uh, was the daughter of a rabbi who uh, migrated to Mannheim from France. The migration movement after 45 are one of the main topics of our permanent exhibition and we examine, examine the topic from different sides. If you look at uh, the design, you can see that after 1945, there is a bridge uh, leading through the room with different um, figures on it um, and uh, dates about the development of Jewish life in Germany. So um, visitors are led through the room um, by this bridge. And as an antidote to these dry figures, you can watch films and footages from uh, the past decades. And of course, these are private footages so that you have a lot of um, personal evidence about uh, migration. You have footages about displaced persons from the Czech Republic or from Romania and Iran. As one of the highlight topics, um, we have uh, Russian speaking uh, Jews. Here you can see some objects that uh, were given by them to the Jewish Museum. And here, of course, we present the objects together or linked to their stories, migration stories. And uh, in this way, they receive a different significance, a different meaning. They become historic objects or historical objects um, with a very strong significance, which goes beyond the personal value. And finally, I would like to tell you that um, in the coming years, we will have further object days. We want to collect objects and migration stories and um, make stories visible for our collection. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tamar. Um, this is a very fascinating picture of uh, different objects. Um, a part of them is already in our collection. Others are still in use. And um, now we have about 20 minutes. And well, I actually, uh, I don't really see all the questions on my iPad, so please um, I would like to ask our technicians to give me some help, but um, I promise I will answer all your questions. So let me begin with a question to Inka Bertz. Inka, what do we know about Mendelssohn's own attitude towards his portraits? Portraits, sorry. Uh, do we know how he liked them? And how often did he actually um, act as a model for portraits? And another question that came to my mind is that it's quite fascinating that Mendelssohn seems to be the first Jew in Germany um, who was a, a model for a, um, for a bust. And um, I was asking myself whether that became a trend afterwards, whether other Jews um, after him, uh, famous Jews, also had their three-dimensional images um, taken. Well, about Mendelssohn, um, we don't really know. He didn't really leave us any uh, he didn't any uh, leave any uh, texts about his opinion about his own portraits. 
um, but um, there were so many portraits painted. Gleim um, paid for the first portrait of Mendelssohn for the Friendship um, Temple um, after Mendelssohn had become um, famous because of the Fiedern. So since 1767 there's been almost a flood of uh, Mendelssohn portraits and Kodowiecki also um, painted him or made drawings of him and this became popular because of a coin by Abramson. So we have uh, several patterns, several sh kinds of portraits and um, they formed various traditions and were more or less popular in their own time. And um, after the feeder, miniatures became quite popular, but more for private households. So there were different fashions and trends and uh, waves of popularity. So there must have been around five to ten portraits um, that were mm, taken during Mendelssohn's lifetime, but whether other Jews followed his example is really difficult to answer. I don't know of any other example. Um, the bust that we had in the Jewish Museum in the entrance hall where Mendelssohn was on one side and on the other side we had the bust of Max Klein, um, Abraham Geiger. I think that was a posthumous uh, bust and I think uh, that um, there was no life model for this bust. It was probably done on the basis of uh, um, photography. And of course then in the modern era we had busts of Einstein and Liebermann and all kinds of famous Jews. But that was later. Okay, we have a question about the second presentation by Teresa Zier. Uh, there was one very attentive member of the audience who we know watching us, but I'm not going to say the name. So the question to you, Teresa, is um, whether all the bicycles are moving away from the sign or two of the bicycles are moving towards the photographer. Could be, yes. Um, Maybe I was going too far in saying that all the bicycles are moving away from the photographer, but what was important to me is that they're all quite far away. So he didn't take photos when somebody was close by. That was my main point. Teresa, one more question um, about this. I was asking myself about diversity. Um, it's something that we might not know. Did he take photos of all the signs that he saw or were there other signs that he wasn't interesting in, interested in because he had already taken similar photos and maybe he was trying to make a very diverse uh, collection. Maybe he went through 50 villages uh, with such signs but he only took 30 pictures because the others were re repetitive. Well, we don't know. I think there are two signs that were photographed twice. Uh, the others are all individual photos and we know that so far we don't know uh, where the um, uh, where the original slides of these photos are. So we just had to accept the photos the way they were donated to us. We then tried to um, reconstruct the route and we noticed that in some areas more signs were photographed than in other areas but I, I don't know or we don't know for what reason Fürstenberg made his choices. Um, probably he was trying to capture a certain diversity. I, I guess that might be right. Tamar, how do these object days work in practice? How do you reach your target group and how representative are the persons who participate in these projects? How representative are the objects they bring into it? Um, 
Well, first question, um, it's a lot of work. Uh, each time we organize such um, a project, uh, we have to find the right framework for it because we can't just go into the city and ask big groups. We have to contact in individuals, but we have lots of people who help us with that in the communities, in educational institutions, but it's a lot of work and we have lots of volunteers helping us with these projects and without them we wouldn't be able to carry out all these interviews. It's a lot of logistic work and that's why we're not uh, as far as we would like to be at this stage. And uh, at the same time, it's a big chance for us because we um, get in touch with so many people in the communities um, and we hope that we are going to stay in touch with the groups of people that we contact throughout the course of this project. And um, on the question of uh, being representative or not, that's very difficult to say. We don't um, set any, well, we don't predefine um, the term migrational object. For us, it's not important um, what kind of object the participants bring in. We don't ask them whether they are halakhic Jews. Uh, we don't ask them wh whether they are an active part of a religious community or not. That's not relevant. Um, everybody who um, identifies as part of a jury um, with a view to their personal migration story is invited to participate. So our collections have lots of objects and the majority of these objects are of course acquired or donated uh, by persons who fled from Germany and not so much people who uh, came to Germany or re-migrated. You have some examples of people re-migrating and bringing things back from England, for example. So that's a multiple migration story. And these objects have um, crossed borders in both directions. So that um, poses interesting questions. What is the meaning of these objects uh, for um, during the course of a biography and I think that because of this project we also have the chance to open up a new field, research on Jews who have come to Germany after 1945 and who were not um, raised in um, the German cultural sphere and we are very interested in that. Here I have another question. Is there going to be um, a recording of this panel? Yes. Uh, the Liu Beck Institute and uh, the Federal Agency for Civic Education are going to put this panel online. Of course, my colleagues are also invited to ask each other questions. Let me check if I have any more questions from the audience here. Teresa, one more question to you. Um, you said that most of these photos were taken up to 35 and then many of these signs had vanished. And that could have something to do with uh, Jews having already left the countryside and moved into the big cities. And many small towns, um, Uh, Jews made up 30 or 40 percent of the population only 60 or 70 years before and then in uh, after 1935 um, there were no Jews left in these small places and maybe it also has something to do with the Olympics because um, the Germans didn't want Germany to look bad in the face of a lot of international journalists coming to the country. Uh, we know, for example, that the Stürmer magazines 
um, showcases disappeared during the time of the Olympics from many places. And we also talked about the fact that um, such signs were also um, talked about in the Jewish press, especially around that time. We have uh, reports about that from April, May, June 1935 in Jewish newspapers. And that's very interesting because it means that these anti-Semitic acts were talked about in the public media. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, that's true and it's confirmed um, by uh, the slideshows of the Central Jewish um, Information Office, uh, which uh, date back to 35 and 36. So Fürstenberg might even have had a little, um, well, he, uh, they might have asked him to take photos uh, for these slideshows, but we don't know about that. So maybe he, it was his uh, mission, so to say, to document the exclusion of Jews. Of course, after 35 um, and around 37, many of these signs had disappeared. Inka, would you like to say something? Yes, you offered us to ask each other questions. So I'm going to take up that offer and ask Tamam a question. So I want to um, comment on um, what you said about being representative or not. That question is quite important. Maybe you could say a little bit about the work in the museum. What's different between social research? What's the difference between social research, empiric social research and museum work? Because um, in museums, we are not displaying representative social statistics. Maybe you could uh, speak a little about uh, the way you see an exhibition as being representative or not. Maybe some objects have become more frequent than others. That's not easy to answer because we are still evaluating the process and um, our findings. So I already mentioned some groups of objects that we have more often. We don't have so many travel documents. We have a lot of uh, family memorabilia that are very important for the families. And we have lots of things that are not Jewish because our big question is what makes an object Jewish? So at the moment, we're still looking at all these objects. We don't want to draw conclusions yet, but this is going to be the next step. Um, we want to take some of these objects into our exhibitions in, at the museum and then we're going to have to uh, evaluate that more thoroughly. Um, we have, we'll have to um, evaluate how representative these objects are in highlighting certain aspects of migration and how can it be integrated into our collections. Um, but these are questions that we're going to ask ourselves in the second phase of the project. We haven't reached this point yet and we're not hurrying because at the moment we want to stay open to what is brought to us. I have a question to Teresa. Do you have any proof um, or do you have any hints that the Jew, uh, that uh, the signs were removed by Jews as a form of resistance? Well, I don't know. Maybe, Aubrey, you can say something about that. Do you know anything about that? Um, I think that in my presentation, I highlighted that it took a lot of courage to even take photos of these signs. It wasn't only journalistic work, but it was a visualization process that was dangerous 
in those times. The signs themselves say how um, brutal the spirit, uh, the ruling spirit was. Uh, to be honest, I don't know um, either. I don't know about resistance um, groups taking down signs. Maybe we could find out a little bit about that in court records, but I think it's quite unlikely because um, I think that would have had very negative um, consequences for the Jewish groups in the repressions for Jewish groups in these places would have been extremely harsh. So I guess that nobody would have taken these signs down for reasons of resistance. Um, Tamar, another question to you. What was the most spectacular object that you uh, have received uh, during the course of your Object Day project? Oh, that's very difficult to answer because well, I have to say, if you participate in these object days and carry out these interviews, when you um, carry out the interviews, everything seems very spectacular because the stories are very interesting and very moving. So most of us um, really value these objects that um, we have talked about with their owners. I personally have one or two favorites. Um, one is from a family of that um, re-migrated into Germany, a German family that had deep roots in Germany and um, they have a so-called Wanderers book from the middle of the 19th century. They um, brought that to France. They were imprisoned in Gurs and the parents married in Gurs in France and then they went back to Germany and brought this book back to Germany. But there are other moving stories as well. For example, the evacuation to Central Asia. That's uh, and I met a dimension that um, opens up a totally different narrative. So I can't really answer your question because it's um, very closely linked to the stories. Well, I think one answer to that would be that that um, the audience is also invited to make up their own minds about these objects. When it's possible to come to the Jewish Museum again and uh, to visit our permanent exhibition, previously known as new exhibition, but now it's our permanent exhibition. It's full of fascinating objects, so maybe you can come to the museum and make up your own mind. So now I'm going to close the first panel of this conference. I thank my colleagues Inka Bertz, Teresa Zier and Tamar Lewinsky for their presentations. I thank you very much for your interest and for watching this panel and I invite all of you to take a little break and then come back. to watch the opening event here on this stage. It's going to have a keynote discussion on Jewish life to do today, a multitude of voices. The discussion is going to be moderated by Dr. Josef Joffe. He's going to talk to our di museum director, Hetty Berg, and to Max Czolix, the writer. Thank you very much.